Today, we have the huge honor of getting to hear and learn from Whitney Trotter. Whitney Trotter is a registered dietitian and RN, anti-racism educator and consultant, and human trafficking activist. Whitney's mission is to create a world where every individual has equal representation and access to culturally competent and informed care. Whitney is the co-founder and medical trainer of RestoreCore, a nonprofit organization here in Memphis, Tennessee, that exists to eradicate human trafficking by empowering survivors, equipping communities, and seeking justice through systematic change. RestoreCore was birthed to bridge the gap between anti-trafficking awareness and providing resources for victims of human trafficking. In addition to RestoreCore, Whitney has also established her own private practice, Bluff City Health, a place of compassion, healing, and self-discovery of nutritional health. Bluff City Health was founded to be a resource for survivors of complex trauma, the eating disorder community, and communities of color. Yes, that is a whole lot of credentials, but the bottom line is that Whitney Trotter is impressive, and we have a lot to learn from her. In this episode, we discuss bridging the gap. Whitney has stepped into some difficult, complicated spaces for the sake of those in need. Her journey, her story, and her wisdom will educate and enlighten us to how we too can be people who bridge the gap. So let's get to it and meet Whitney Trotter in the green chair. Uh, Whitney, thank you so much for being here with us in the green chair. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah, this is me. this is really exciting. Yeah. Okay, so I want us to know a little bit about you. We know your husband. Yes. Yeah, yes. he was on, he was in the green chair. He was in the green chair. Yeah. And it's not too scary. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about you. From Memphis. No, I'm originally from Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I've, we've been in Memphis almost ten years. Oh, so nice. coming up on our 10-year uh, Memphian anniversary. Nice. So, okay. Yeah. And you and Jeff been married? We have been married since 2013, so seven years. Nice. Yeah. And then you have a yeah. precious little girl. We do, MJ. She's four. Uh, we like to joke four going on 14. Yes. She is <laughs> quite the personality, but yes. we love it. We love it. Okay. So tell me a little so. bit about your story. I mean, kind of you're in college and then you... Going to be a dietitian or tell yes. me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was a college athlete and my coach was amazing, um, very heavy on the student athlete second. And I kind of, nutrition kind of fell into my lap, honestly. I, I knew I wanted to do something in sciences, but I played at a, a mid major Division One. And so just with our travel schedule and everything, mm. Um, it was kind of hard, and I have um, my entire family is athletic or military. Okay. So um, my dad is one of thirteen, and so yeah, every cousin um, has yeah very very gifted athletically. So I had a cousin that played football for University of Miami oh, wow. when they went to the Rose Bowl, and so he was just really great about you know the pursuit of education. And so I was like, okay, I I need to really think about this while I'm in college. So. Um, I had a professor who is Nigerian and studied HIV and um, just kind of fell in love with infectious disease and the ability to, to give back to a population that a lot of people don't talk about. Hmm. That's so. really, really great. Yeah. And so one of the things we're going to talk about is you have these really cool... Um, I don't know if I want to say arms, if you will, but you have these like passions, yeah. right? Yeah. And you have this restore core and then you have Bluff City Health. Yes. And I want us to talk about both of those separately. Yeah. Um, but the, the lens I want us to look through is bridging the gap because you, uh, you kind of started jumping a little bit into your story, but you have kind of stepped into some really difficult spaces. Um, yeah. And you kind of, what you're saying, being attracted to infectious diseases, like that's very yeah. rare. So I would love for you to kind of start yeah. going down going down that, that story, that journey. Um, yeah, so when I, in undergrad, I went to University of Tennessee Martin, which is like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, but being from Austin, my parents just did a really good job of just exposing us. And again, a majority of my family is athletes and, and or military. And so um, just grew up with a really appreciation of cultural awareness. A hmm. um, little limited in Martin. Um, <laughs> but when I decided I wanted to study HIV, um, so ironically, to be a dietitian is pretty and cumbersome. It's kind of difficult. So you do this undergrad, and then you have to do an internship, but you have to match. Oh. And I did not match. And so I was a college athlete, GPA, very involved. 
And so I was like, okay, well, how can I use this year? And because I wanted to do HIV, I would drive from Martin to Memphis, two and a half hours, wow. once a week, and I volunteered at an HIV AIDS ran daycare. And then from there, I got a job as the HIV outreach educator for Memphis, Shelby County. So moved to Memphis, didn't really know again from Austin. Um, so I, I went from Austin to Iowa, played mm-hmm. basketball two years there, then from Tennessee and then uh, Martin to Memphis. Okay. So I didn't really understand the complexities of Memphis until mm-hmm. I moved and kind of got involved. And it just opened up a lot um, in me and for me. Um, so yeah, so then I started doing HIV work. Uh, was really blessed to then finally be able to match, did grad school, University of Memphis. Um, but I had called St. Jude because I found out that they had an HIV adolescent clinic. And I begged them, I was like, what do I have to do to be able to study here? And at the time, it was a, a black woman that ran their uh, nutrition support for um, P, uh, pediatrics and adolescents living with HIV and AIDS. And she was like, get into University of Memphis, tell them you want to study HIV, and I'll be your mentor. That's wow. what she did. Yeah. Wow. So I got to spend a year um, in the infectious disease clinic at uh, St. Jude, and it was it changed my life. Oh yeah, I changed can my life. imagine. So. Yeah. And then from there, how did you get connected to did Rape Crisis Center? Yeah. So from there, so there's two nurse practitioners that also worked at the Memphis Rape Crisis Center. So after I graduated with my master's, I then uh, started working at what's well, the regional one health center now, but yeah. formerly known, known as the Med. Well, they have a center of excellence, and so you see um, every every social, economic, gender, race, identity that is living with HIV and AIDS in Memphis and Shelby County. And so um, from there, it just really developed my passion for trauma informed care. Hmm. Um, and I had two mentors that worked as nurse practitioners in HIV, but also at the Rape Crisis Center. Um, and so they connected me, got uh, started there, started doing um, intake and after hour calls. And um, that is kind of what led Rachel and I to connect and form uh, Restore Corps. Okay. And tell us so, a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, it was so interesting. I always say that God just, God really for sure had a hand on our life because we were in our 20s, had no, none of us knew how to do a nonprofit. Uh, Rachel was working at Huey's. I, I can't remember what Ryan <laughs> and Stephanie were doing at the time. I just graduated uh, graduate school. Um, but through that, nobody was talking about human trafficking 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, definitely not in the United States and definitely not in Memphis. I mean, it just wasn't yeah. talked about, but we were seeing it. We knew it was happening. Yeah. Um, so we were part of another organization and wanted to be faith-based. So the four of us decided to start our own nonprofit and that's what we did. And at the time, again, we were so young, you know, I think that, um, a lot of people took pity on us, which was so great for us. <laughs> um, but we got to do some really amazing things. We were involved with the TBI and, and got to go to Nashville for a training. We worked with the FBI, Homeland Security, um, got to do uh, Steve Cohen's office, approached us, got to wow. lead a, um, a joint conference with Homeland Security. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it's pretty amazing. Um, but honestly, they really just embraced us hmm. and um, let us kind of lead the way with victim services. And we just, we all worked together and it was a really, really beautiful experience. Wow, that's really so, cool. Okay, so yeah. I would love for you to just educate us a little bit on um, kind of what RestoreCore does now. Like what does that yeah. practically look like um, kind of day in, day out? Yeah, so again, when we started RestoreCore, there was four of us okay. um, and never envisioned to what it was today. So when we talked about human trafficking, especially being in Memphis, um, and I, I truly believe this, you can't really embrace anti-trafficking without embracing anti-racism work. Mm. Um, and so there was a big divide and disconnect. And a lot of people don't realize that human trafficking is modern day slavery. And yes. you and I talked about yes. this. Yes. Um, so a lot of statistics show that there's roughly about 30.2 million people that are living in some form of captivity or bondage. Wow. Um, so what essentially human trafficking is, is it's force, fraud, or corrosion Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's, it usually involved a sex act. It um, mm-hmm. doesn't always. We have labor trafficking, organ trafficking, um, but it's those use of means of the force to keep somebody in captivity mm-hmm. against their will. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we talk about that, again, we think a lot about internationally. We don't yes. really understand what that looks like in our communities. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and so we had to do a lot of education early on to get people to understand it is happening in Memphis. Mm -hmm. um, it does not discriminate. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I always tell people this, if you think about drug trafficking or gun trafficking, you um, use that entity once. But humans are used as commodities, hmm. and it's the exploitation over and over and over. Hmm. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing education, doing awareness, um, and then that really kind of led us to look at, okay, well, what are we doing? How are we actually coming alongside survivors? Because um, it doesn't do any good to do all this community awareness, but then not have a place where survivors can get help. Yeah. Um, and so that led us to open up a safe house. Yeah. And so we have a safe house. That's um, great. Yeah, which is really, really neat. So it sounds like it was just kind of ever evolving. Like you just kind of like you started one thing and then yeah. you started another thing and it just kind of grew and grew and grew. Yeah. And I love the connection you have too with uh, our global department, or they call it now Glocal. Glocal, which yeah. is Which is fun because essentially, you know, the yeah. pandemic happens and then we can't travel internationally. Yeah. And so we're like, we need to invest in our city. We need to invest yeah. in, in places here. And that's how Glocal happened, which is essentially yeah. our partnership with RestoraCorp, yeah. which yeah. is really, really cool. Because yeah. I think they do things like you do clothing. Don't you do clothing donations, landscape? Like, tell me a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, because there's pieces of that, that you have the safe house and then you have the education wing, but then you're also kind of, um, I'd love for you to talk about those other spaces too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we were kind of envisioning RestoraCorp, one of the things we learned early on is people like a step-by-step -step process, right? <laughs> like people can't just go from like not hearing about human trafficking to then supporting a survivor, right? And so we were trying to really imagine like, well, what are the in-between? Like some people, it's, and I always say like, everybody can do something, whether that's time, energy, or resources. Mm. And so how can we make a space to where each one of those is applicable? Uh, so with a safe house, what we've done is we've gotten volunteers to do landscaping, to do renovations, to help with grocery shopping, hmm. um, or you know, at our offices, those that have really good organizational skills, uh, <laughs> which is not my gifting, uh, <laughs> to come in and, and just kind of help with some of those tasks, which then frees us up to be able to walk in our strengths. Yeah, um, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. And then uh, I love that you mentioned the statistics and the idea that we don't really realize it's in our city, it's in our home. I mean, yeah. I would love for you to talk a little bit. I think we have a lot of misconceptions when it, talks, when it comes to human trafficking. I think yes. um, conversations that I'm having, I think a lot of people are oblivious to, to the reality that this is happening even here in Memphis, Tennessee, oh, yeah. here in Tennessee. I mean, I'd, I'd love for you to speak to that. Absolutely, absolutely. So what we know from human trafficking, um, obviously we know it, it's global, right? 30.2 30 million people. What's really interesting, so 2011 is actually the year that we went to uh, Nashville and did uh, a training with the TBI. And TBI at that time had partnered up with Vanderbilt, and they did a statewide study. So they looked at every single county in Tennessee, and this was in 2011. Wow. So in 2011, a report came out that showed 85% of Tennessee counties had at least one documented trafficking. Hmm. So then from there, what we realized was, okay, it's not realistic to have a nonprofit in every county, right? And you can't have a shelter in every county. So then we started looking at, well, when we're getting survivors and victims and they're coming in, what's their story? Hmm. Like, what, what's their story? And Tennessee is a landlocked state. So I always say human trafficking looks so different, West Coast, East Coast, and the South, right? So we're landlocked. So we know that even though we have some immigrant or refugees or trafficking victims that are trafficked into the United States, um, a lot of our trafficking survivors are U.S. citizens. And again, that's like for the state of Tennessee. So then from there, what we did was we came back to Memphis, kind of regrouped. And as we started getting uh, referrals in from law enforcement at that time, that was our biggest FBI, TBI, MPD, um, biggest kind of source of, of referrals, we started like, what's their story? Hmm. And poverty, you know, poverty is a really large contributor to this. And when you have a city that has a lot of economic disadvantages, um, you're going to see an increase in human trafficking. And I would say I think the biggest misconception is people think that uh, trafficking victims are, you know, just behind bars, like literally like in cages. And is that true? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But we also have a lot of survivors that are in school, that are working, 
um, that are still kind of doing day-to-day tasks wow. that aren't always presenting as trafficking victims. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And thank you for, for sharing all that. And yeah. um, so another education piece too, I'd like to take some of these opportunities as well to yeah. um, not only educate us a little bit as to what human trafficking looks like, city of Memphis, Tennessee, um, but also to take an opportunity to say, okay, let's talk about language, right? You'll talk about, yeah. uh, you'll, you call, uh, you say victim, not victims, you say survivors, survivors. clients. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, yeah, that absolutely, language. Absolutely, absolutely. So when we started Restore Corps, we were, we did not um, get a salary or money for that. We all had day jobs, <laughs> um, you know, the woes of nonprofit work initially, um, so we were very intentional that the first person that we actually hired that was going to be a paid employee, we really wanted to be somebody that either was um, a survivor or um, had, you know, um, was kind of in that area, yes. so to speak. Yes. Um, so we were very intentional about that. And we learned um you know, we really want to empower people that work with us. Mm. Um, And so I think that empowerment is why we use the word survivor. Mm. Um, Because not that, not that um, we want to keep people victimized, right? We really want to empower them so they're not self-reliant on us, right? So we want to come in, bridge the gap, provide a resource, but we really want you to be able to be self-sufficient, you know? That's perfect, yeah. Um, and so I use the word client a lot because my background is in mental health. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes I use patient. I'm a nurse too. But I like <laughs> the word client because to me it, it, it really embodies that we're equal and it's mm. not like a superior. I'm not mm-hmm. the authority and you're subservient as my patient, mm-hmm. you know, and so we're working this process together. Mm. So. And you even mentioned too uh, when we were talking that sometimes even uh, survivors don't really yeah. identify as a survivor. It doesn't, absolutely. they don't feel like they're survivors. So they yeah. identify as a client. Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, if you look um, like Memphis, Memphis is a city that is has a lot of complex trauma. Hmm. Um, and so when you live in a, a trauma filled environment and that's all, you know, it's hard to recognize that that's, you know, not necessarily normal. Hmm. Okay. So, so I let you kind of, you said the word bridging the gap a second ago, yeah. <laughs> and I want to lean into that a little bit with yeah. specifically with RestoraCore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, you stepped going from, uh, St. Jude to rape crisis center. I mean, you leaned into this, there were gaps that you saw, right? Things yeah. that were happening that needed initiative. They needed help. They needed somebody to kind of step in there. Yeah. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, um, particularly with Restore Core, mm-hmm. any like lessons along the way of leaning into those gaps. I mean, that takes yeah. a lot of work. I mean, you said you had jobs while you were doing this. Like this wasn't your, yeah. you weren't getting paid to do this. Yeah, so yeah. that, I mean, yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit. What pushed you to do that? And um, yeah. Um, it's so interesting. Jeff and I always joke when we first started dating, I was on call. And so like I'd get called at like two or three in the morning and he'd be like, wait, what are you doing? Like, and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a pastor. Like what you, and I, and so it was like, you know, so interesting. We always joke about it to this day because it's so counterintuitive, right? Like you don't really see that side of Memphis or that side of complex trauma. And, um, and so, yeah, I think I'll never forget. I prayed a prayer once, and um, and I really prayed that God would break my heart for what broke His. Hmm. And oh my gosh, I'm gonna start crying. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what we tried mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we really wanted to create a safe space because I think when you, um, you know, people we didn't people were going through hell, mm. and we didn't want them to not be believers Mm. because of their environment. Mm. That's really powerful. And it takes, I mean, it takes courage, you know? I mean, it takes, um, I I just, I really do commend you for your your courage and your willingness to step into that gap because there's a lot of people um, that are uncomfortable with that gap. There's a lot of people that are uncomfortable having a conversation. Like you even said, you're in your 20s and you're like, uh... We don't really know what we're doing, but there's a need and we're going to love those people and we're going to preach the gospel to them and we're going to like, we're going to be Jesus to these people. And that means we got to figure out how to do this. Yeah. And you use your time to do that. Yeah. And I think we didn't have any money. I mean, again, we were (laughs) broke. I mean, I just graduated grad school and, 
you know, none of us were in our careers. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think there's humility in the process, yes. you know, and I think too, that's why we had favor because we were very honest of like, this was a passion and we wanted to do it. Nobody else was doing it, but we didn't know how. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, like four 20 year olds starting a nonprofit working in human trafficking that no one's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's, it's so interesting when we talk about kind of the social justice and interaction with Christianity. I think sometimes it gets so overwhelming, people get stuck. Yeah. And it's hard to it's hard to kind of walk in that and, and help and um, find your way into some of these dark places because you just don't know how to take the first step. Hmm. And so that's what we do, kind of going back to how people can get involved. Like that's what we try to do with our volunteers mm -hmm. of like if you if human trafficking is an interest to you and you want to take that first step, how can we help you? Well, I really do commend you for taking the initiative in that because I think that that, to me personally, that's been so inspiring is to say yeah. you saw something that is hard that a lot of people want to look the other way. Uh, you saw something that we don't really want to talk about that we're probably uncomfortable talking about truthfully. Yeah. Um, you saw that and you said, I'm going to lean in. You know, yeah. I'm going to lean into this this space here. So I, I really do commend you for, for doing Thank that. You. Um, okay, so I want to also talk about Bluff City Health. Yeah. That's a new thing, it and is. I'm excited about that. It is. So Bluff City Health. So I, um, you know, my passion is is trauma and human trafficking, but also eating disorders. Um, and so I actually um, started working several years ago, started noticing some disordered eating in my HIV AIDS population. Hmm. But a lot of people don't associate eating disorders with the black and brown community. Um, and so there was just a, a very large disconnect. And so as I started kind of working in my career, I came more familiar uh, with eating disorders and disordered eating and worked at uh, various levels of care. Um, so I am one of the few dietitians that's worked kind of residential PHP and IOP, which are kind of fancy terms for different levels of care. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say, eating can, you, can you explain world? that to the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Different, you know, just different levels of care. Um, <laughs> okay. And so I actually was a director, uh, nutrition and nursing director of an eating disorder facility. Um, and it was an amazing experience. I actually have several friends that uh, are clinicians that are still uh, just very instrumental in my life now. Um, but, you know, I did that and I, I really just wanted to create a space that um, every lived identity that were struggling with eating disorders had a safe place to provide treatment, hmm. you know, because I think representation is important. Yes. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. And so um, three of my colleagues were starting their private practices and it was, you know, much more encumbersome and, um, than that. But um, a lot of a lot of prayer. Yeah, that and, sounds too easy. Yeah, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that easy. That, that'll be another green tree. Um, but yeah, so I I'm. It was honestly a God thing because I was making really good money and um, I was really scared. Hmm. But Jeff was so supportive and he was like, I really think that this is where God is leading us. And I was like, mm. You sure? I was like, Are you sure? I was like, I got a lot of student loan debt. Um, but we did it, and you know it was hard. Yeah. But um, it's been amazing. It's been a wild ride having a, a private practice and a business in a pandemic. Yep. Because um, I've always had like three or four jobs, but this is like now I just have one job. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's been good though. It's okay. Been good. And then that is so. What and what? What is your emphasis on again? It's on. Yeah. So it's on eating disorders and disordered eating, but okay. I have a special emphasis for the BIPOC community. And BIPOC okay. is Black, Indigenous, People of Color, and I treat I treat everyone. Yeah. I treat all yeah. races, ethnicities, genders, um, but I definitely do have that emphasis of representation and wanting to provide care uh, for Black and Brown people with eating disorders because um, there's not a lot of representation um, mm -hmm. in that area. Wow. Okay, so, so that's another bridging the gap, right? Yeah. So you yeah. see this need, you're yeah. seeing something that's existing, and you're like, this isn't being cared for properly, right, when yeah. you were saying with your HIV patients. Yeah. So talk a little bit about bridging that gap there. I mean, what is that? I mean, you jumped into... Yeah. yeah, I mean, you you made it sound really easy. Yeah. And I know you said it's not easy, but yeah. I mean, you started your own practice and you started really leaning into those conversations as well. It's so hard. So when we talk about, you know, diet culture is so pervasive. Yes. And especially being... I'm seeing so much of that right now, so too. So much. Mm -hmm. And um, especially, you know, being a person of faith, but then also married to somebody in ministry, mm -hmm. right? I, 
I just see so much the diet culture that's influenced, especially with women, and yes. this thought of like the American standard of beauty yes. and how it plagues us. Yes. And so, but then, I, I mean, I went through a lot of doubt as can I as a black woman really step into the world of eating disorders, which in large part, a lot of affluent white women yep. have eating disorders, yes. you know, yeah. and they have access to treatment. Yes. So what I started seeing is people that do not have health insurance or do not come from affluent backgrounds could not afford or access care. Wow. So when I left and started Bluff City Health, I really was intentional about pricing. I was intentional about offering sliding skills and scholarships. Hmm. Um, but I also was really intentional that therapists that I work with also see that need as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, it was a community of women that really helped me. I mean, I could not have done this without the other people pouring into me. Yeah. Um, but it's been crazy because I am not, uh, if any of y'all know Jeff, he's like, love social media. <laughs> I hate social media. I'm like, Ugh. Um, So when I started my Instagram, I was like, oh, imposter syndrome was so real, you know? But it was crazy because at the height of George Floyd, what was happening on Instagram is it was blowing up with social justice, anti-racism, but also anti-diet and eating disorders. So what is so interesting is through that, I actually got connected to a group of other black dietitians that were doing eating disorders. And there's only 10 of us in the United States. 10? 10. So it was mind wow. blowing. So that, we, that, yeah, that blows my mind. Yeah. So as far as I know, I'm the only black provider in the state of Tennessee that has wow. specialized training in eating disorders. Wow. Yeah. So it's, I mean, and roughly, I think the last kind of stat I read is 75 million people are either diagnosed with an eating disorder or have disordered eating. Wow. So that's been really interesting talking about bridging the gap of like really advocating for cultural competent care. And Mm. what does that look like Mm. when you go into a treatment center and you see no one that looks like you? Wow. You know? Wow. That's really, Uh, really impressive. Okay. So let's talk lessons along the way and application for those listening and things that, um, I guess just lessons, things that you would remind us, encourage us, challenge us. You said it's not been an easy journey. I would imagine that's an understatement. Yeah. Uh, But just lessons along the way and kind of what you'd want to share with us. You know, I would say stepping out in fear. You know, mm. I think I think fear paralyzes a lot of us. Yes. And we feel an imposter syndrome is so real. Um, but I think when you step out in fear and just know that, um, it, and it sounds so cliche, but it's so true that faith over fear. Mm. I can't imagine when we think about our 10-year history of Restore Corps or just all the work that I've done in eating disorder, if I never would have taken that leap of faith. Because mm. it wasn't easy. Yeah. I mean, it was not easy. And you, but you... I think God just, he continually meets us every step of the way, Mm. you know? And even when he says, and you and I talked about this, like he said no to some really good prayers, Mm. but our, you know, my faith is still rooted and grounded in him. Mm. That's really, really good. Stepping out in fear. I like that. That'll preach. Yeah. (laughs) That's really good. That's really good. Um, Okay. So any uh, people are sitting here listening and they're thinking, okay, I've got that nudge. I've got that. I know that there's a gap here, whether it's, it could be human trafficking. It could be eating disorders. It could be anything. Um, It may not be. Uh, But what what advice would you give them just in, um, to to take that jump, to to Mm. step out in fear? You know, I would say find your passion. Yeah. Because then it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. You know, yeah. like yeah. Restore Corps has never felt like work, mm. you know, and it's God's calling. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of this. And Memphis is such a beautiful city because there is a lot of brokenness, but there's so much hope, mm. you know, no pun intended. But like, <laughs> um, and there's so many ways to get involved, Yeah, you know. And so I would say, like, if you're feeling that nudge, find something that you're passionate about to mm. volunteer. And again, it's not always about money. Like, do we want people to donate? Absolutely. Yeah. But it's the time and energy and resources that a lot of people that are in broken situations could use. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's so. that's really good. And I appreciate that you even acknowledge the fact that you're literally just stepping out in fear. Like it's, yeah. I think sometimes it's easy when people, we watch these conversations. I watch other people have these conversations, yeah. you know, I'll talk to you and be like, man, she did it and she's doing it all, like she was courageous and I, oh. it's, I'm, I, you yeah. know, but I, I think 
there's something about being able to just own the fact it is terrifying. Oh, that yes. is, you know, that is that is yeah. helpful. And mm-hmm. I think we don't. I think we think. I, you know what? I read something that said all we need is like ten seconds of insane courage. Yes. Right. Just ten seconds of insane courage yeah. because it's terrifying. Yeah. And then you make that call. You send that text message. You initiate something yeah. that kind of has a chain reaction throughout throughout the rest of it. Absolutely. So. That's really Absolutely. good. Thank you so yeah. much for, yeah. for sharing with us. Thank you so much for your time. You. And uh, I just appreciate you being with us here in the thank Green you. Chair. Thanks thank for you. having me. Yeah, thank you. And that is a wrap for our Green Chair conversation with Whitney Trotter. Thank you so much for being connected with us today. Don't forget, you can encourage someone today by sharing this conversation with a friend or watch any previous conversations at hopechurchmemphis.com forward slash GCC, as well as listen on Spotify or Apple podcast apps. And as always, feel free to email me at greenchair at hopechurchmemphis.com. Love you guys. See you next week.